All right, let's get this show started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. It's good to be back with you for another edition of our exciting program. My name is Chris Smith, and I am your host most Wednesdays for the Lunchtime Discovery Series, broadcasted by the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, where I work, and organized by the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality. So, uh, before we jump in, I want to give a special thank you to Laura Beth Spear for guest hosting last week's program for me so that I could get a little bit of a break. Thanks, LB. Really appreciate it. Uh, I heard that the program was excellent, and uh, I've still got to go back and watch it because uh, last week they did Murray Burgess at NC State, and uh, I was looking forward to that one. So everybody, so you know too, you can go back and watch these programs again, or if you miss one, you can find them on the YouTube playlist labeled Lunchtime Discovery Series right here on the museum's YouTube channel. Uh, there are dozens of these there now, so there's a great resource for you to learn just about anything you could want to learn about, at least related to science, nature, education, those sorts of things. So it's very exciting stuff. Now, because this is the month of February, and February is Black History Month, we've been celebrating here on the Lunchtime Discovery Series every Wednesday at noon by inviting interesting people with great stories, doing really great work, uh, giving us the opportunity to learn about what's happening out there in the world and celebrate their achievements. And today is no different. Uh, very excited for today's guest because we've been chatting a little bit before the show, uh, and today's guest I think is a very interesting person and has got some really cool science and stories to share with us today. Everybody, please welcome Dr. Melissa Minto to the program. Dr. Minto is a bioinformatics scientist at RTI International right here in the Triangle, not too far from us where I'm at, at least here in downtown Raleigh. Uh, and Dr. Minto has been a contributor to the Black Women in Computational Biology Network. So everybody, great big round of applause. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Chris. Thanks for the introduction. Let's go ahead and get my PowerPoint up. Sure thing. Looks good to me. Great. Yeah. So thank you for that introduction. I'm, I'm Melissa, um, and I recently got my PhD in computational biology and bioinformatics from Duke University. And I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about my journey in science and um, a little bit about what I do as a bioinformatics scientist at RTI. So first of all, what is computational biology and bioinformatics? Some folks in the field like to differentiate the two. So I did some Googling so I could bring you guys the hard facts. Um, Bioinformatics is a science of collecting and analyzing complex biological data, whereas computational biology is defined as using mathematical and computational approaches to address um, theoretical or experimental questions in biology. Uh, so really the difference from my eyes is what I see is bioinformatics is being defined as using um, certain tools to answer questions, whereas computational biology um, is more about developing those mathematical and computational approaches. Uh, but in my experience, if you're working in either field, you're probably going to be doing some of the applying or some of the developing or creating some custom methods. So I tend to use the terms interchangeably. And there's so many questions you can answer under the umbrella of computational biology or bioinformatics. You can focus on metabolomics and do projects that study how different drugs metabolize in your body. You can imagine that this is done a lot in the pharmaceutical space. Um, you can focus and have a more systems biology approach and use mathematical models to study how cells interact with each other um, or how they diffuse signals between each other. Uh, with proteomics, you can study protein-protein interactions and use computational methods to predict those or even how proteins fold. But my flavor of computational biology and bioinformatics is in genetics and genomics. You can ask different questions um, under this, like, what is the function of a gene? You can use other data um, on similar genes and predict its functions based on those similarities. Uh, you could ask, 
what are the differences, the, the genomic differences between two species? Where do those genomic sequences diverge? Uh, you can even ask in human populations or in other populations you want to study, uh, what genomic variations are associated with a disease? So this has been pretty well done for the sickle cell disease, where we know what the genomic variant that causes sickle cell. And because we know that, we can now develop treatments and therapies to try and treat sickle cell. Um, but what drew me into genetics and genomics, and I'll go into this much further, is asking the question, how does our environment affect our genome and thus alter our risk for different diseases? And this really happens through modifications to our DNA called the epigenome. Um, so I went to grad school to kind of become an expert in the epigenome. I'm going to tell you some, some cool things uh, about the epigenome and what I like to study within that realm. So the epigenome or epigenomics is a study of what's on top of the genome, what's on top of your DNA. And there are proteins and molecules that can bind to your DNA to then modify its function. And these mo molecules tend to be uh, removable or modifiable. And what I find that's cool about it is that it's influenced by things like your environment. So your stress levels, your, you know, the, uh, your health habits, your diet, uh, what things you're, uh, what toxins you're exposed to in your environment, all can influence the molecules that are binding to your DNA and regulating its function. So how did I get here? How did I uh, land on epigenomics and want to study this? Uh, uh, I went to Meredith College and got my degrees in mathematics and biology. But to become a computational biologist, uh, many think that you need kind of expertise in like three domains. You need a domain knowledge, um, which is that biology component, usually a specialized field in biology. You need to know statistics and uh, uh, how to analyze uh, data pretty much. And then you also need to know how to code uh, in computer science principles so that we can develop tools and build models to um, yeah, be a, a bioinformaticist or a computational biologist. And I got my, I would say my biology and my statistics knowledge from my degrees in, um, in biology and math, but a lot of my skills were actually fine-tuned through different undergraduate research experiences that I, that I uh, participated in. So during undergrad, I wasn't, you know, sh sure what I wanted to do. I didn't land on epigenomics as yet. Um, and so I took that time to kind of explore different topics and different research opportunities to figure out what I wanted to do. And one of my first um, research experiences with, was at North Carolina Central University, where I worked with Dr. Claire Linda Williams, the vein um, in the lab that she ran there. Um, and it was my first time coding, first time dealing with biological data. Um, and my first project was, here's this code this other um, bioinformaticist used um, with our previous analysis, and we want you to create it in R package. And R is a statistical computing environment where people can write R packages and it, as libraries that other folks can use to kind of help with the analysis of their data. So I thought that was just a huge feat, but at the end of the summer, I did it. I, I wrote the R package, the documentation, submitted it um, to the, <laughs> I want to say R gods so that they can approve it and put it up on their website so other people can download it. And I really fell in love with the idea of coding and just the logic behind coding, I, I, that's when I really fell in love with coding. Um, and towards that experience, towards the end of that summer, I was introduced to genomic data. And I didn't really think much of it. It was just kind of a thing that the lab did. And I was like, okay, cool. I like to code. I don't know about this genomics stuff. Um, but as I continued working in that lab, and I also uh, worked uh, in Dr. Kranos Williams' lab at NC State, 
I worked more with genomic data and I built my skill set on carrying out something called a differential expression analysis. And this is basically taking gene expression data from like a case and control setting and finding which genes are different between the two uh, cases and controls or which genes are more highly expressed or uh, increase a lot more and which genes are turned off or decrease a lot more between case and control. And I got really good at doing that. I ran several of those analyses and I was like, you know what? Yeah, this, this is cool. I can, I can get down with genomics. Um, and towards the end of that uh, experience, I was actually introduced to epigenomic data and epigenomics overall in Dr. Claire Linda's lab. And it wasn't a project that I was actually a part of. Um, it was it was just through conversations of what other people were working on in the lab that I've kind of got drawn in. And so the project was looking at a mom's epigenome and how that affected uh, the severity of their child's asthma. And I was just like, whoa, like, you know, you know, you, you know that you inherit your genes from your mom, but this epigenome that is modifiable by your, you know, kind of your life environment, um, as well as other things can be passed down to your child and affect their health. And I was like, okay, so like the stress and the burden of my mom probably plays a role in like on a biological scale on my health. So I thought that was really interesting. And that actually got me thinking about, you know, just about the health disparities that we see in the United States um, for Black and Brown people and how much of that could be attributed to the epigenome. How much of that is coming from, you know, centuries of oppression, of red zoning where you live and probably affects the kind of pollutants you're uh, uh, exposed to, how much of that is affected by, um, you know, your lifestyle uh, and, you know, the availability of high quality, healthy foods and stress. And so I, that was really me being kind of like, beside the person that worked on this project kind of spurred this whole question and my motivation really for learning about epigenomics. But before I could commit, I was like, uh, I don't know, let me let me try out some some other things to see if this is really what I want to do or what what other kinds of things are out there. And so I also worked at um, a company called Cytovation in their computational toxicology group and learned how to work with uh, yeah, computational uh, chemistry things and learning the the lingo there. And uh, it was a completely different beast from genomic data. And we did a lot of projects there in terms of metabolomics and learning or modeling how different things diffuse. But we also integrated uh, uh, the computational chemistry data with genomic data to ask different questions as well. Um, so I, I found that interesting. And then I also worked at the Museum of Natural Sciences under Dr. Bronwyn Williams, where we studied crayfish. And this is probably the most different thing that I've done throughout my undergrad. Um, and I was like, you know, what? I'm, I'm going to give this a try. And what we did was uh, look, what our goals were, was to look at, you know, pictures of crayfish and see if we could identify morphologically, just based on a picture, um, if we can identify different species. And so typically what you have to do in this setting is to genotype um, crayfish to be able to say, this is different species from others. And especially with my untrained eye, I'm not a crayfish uh, expert. That's what I would have to do. And so we, the goal was to build a machine learning model to kind of look at different pictures of crayfish to see if we could find diverging species or identify species that need to be conserved. Um, with this project, I actually had to do field work. This was my first project that I had to go out in the field. And by the field, I do mean a collections unit <laughs> to take pictures of crayfish, which is really cool to be able to get introduced into that environment. We even went to the Smithsonian's collection unit to take literally hundreds, hundreds of photos of crayfish. Um, 
But from that experience, I learned that field work is not for me. I want to be behind the computer. <laughs> I want to be looking at data and analyzing it. But um, it was it was a really great. Both of these experiences were really great just to learn how to work with different data, the different statistical techniques uh, needed for those kinds of data. And I also were a- was able to build on my different different computational skills outside of just working with genomic data. Um, so yeah, from, from those experiences, I, I decided that, yeah, epigenomics, I want to get into that. And I applied to different schools in the area um, for their comp bio and bioinformatics programs. And I ended up going to Duke. And at Duke, I joined a neurogenomics lab in here in the middle is um, my uh, PI at Duke. Her name is Dr. Ann West um, and surrounded by my lab mates and my lab mates during my time there. And our lab focused on neurogenomics of addiction and development. And during my time there, my long five and a half years there, I pretty much uh honed in on my on those three domains that you need for need to be a computational biologist. I learned a lot more about bioinformatic computing. So before, when I was doing that differential expression analysis, I was pretty much given very clean data that, you know, had no issues and I could just put it into a program and it'll output the genes that are different. But here, I actually took the data from the sequencing machine where you just have a file of A's, C's, G's, and T's and some other information about it and took it to the point where I could perform that differential expression analysis. And even um, further past that, where I can ask more complex questions with that kind of data. And because we're a neurobiology lab, uh, and I was surrounded by folks that knew a lot more about neuroscience than I did, I picked up a lot of that knowledge and, and learned a lot about the neurobiology of addiction and how those pathways work in the brain, as well as the neurobiology behind um, brain development. And of course, all of these things were focused on with a a lens, a genomics lens. So I ended up learning a lot about genomics, how genes are regulated and epigenomics and, you know, all under that umbrella. Um, And with having to kind of build those bioinformatic pipelines and understanding the nuances of neurogenomic data, you also have to uh, ability to fine tune the statistical approaches you use to analyze that data. So I kind of built up on all of those three domains and I want to tell you a story or uh, walk you through one of the projects, one of my first projects that I did um, in the lab. So I've been talking about this epigenome thing. I have a picture to show you more so, more tangibly what that is. Um, So decades of research have told us that molecules can bind onto our DNA to modify it, to either turn genes on or turn genes off. Um, You can have this on your actual nucleotides, on these, you know, A, G, T, and Cs, you can have methyl groups bind to your DNA. And what happens when you accumulate more methyl groups or more methylation on your DNA, it actually becomes more compressed. So things that need to, other things or machinery that needs to bind to your DNA to kind of transcribe the gene or turn the gene on, can't quite do that when there's lots of methylation. Um, Our DNA is also wrapped around these things called histones. And these histones have tails that can also be uh, modified or or other group other molecules can bind to it. So here I'm showing where um, we have acetylation binding to the histone tails versus uh, some methyl groups accumulating and binding to these histone tails. And just like DNA methylation, when we have a lot of histone methylation, the the DNA itself also becomes more condensed and compact and Uh, doesn't allow for things to bind as easily as when we have histone tail acetylation and it allows for, you know, RNA polymerase to bind and other proteins, including transcription factors and chromatin remodelers. These all play a role in how our 3D, like, chromatin is shaped. So this is kind of thinking about our DNA in a linear fashion, whereas on this end of the spectrum, I'm, you're thinking of more how the DNA is folded up and compacted on each other. On each other. 
Um, and these tend, uh, these modifications tend to be regulated by these transcription factors. Um, and transcription factors are DNA binding proteins with different domains. They have this DNA binding domain where um, it recognizes a specific sequence and binds the DNA. And then there's an effector domain that kind of controls the activity of that transcription factor. And because transcription factors are sequence specific, um, yeah, because they bind to a specific DNA sequence, there are bioinformatic methods to predict where a, a transcription factor can bind. So we can kind of scan through a sequence and see, oh, there, it can bind there at this sequence, at this match, and at this match, and so on and so forth. The methods are more complex than this um, and could take into account lots of different information as well. And so I'm using, I'm leveraging this to kind of use big genomic data to uncover biological mechanisms. So we can ask questions by searching target sequences, like where a transcription factor could be binding um, and where in order to understand what genes it's regulating, what modifications is it bringing along with it. And um, we can capture this information bioinformatically, but we can also do it experimentally. Um, we can ask a question of at to what levels genes are expressed. Like I was mentioning earlier with that differential expression analysis, you start off with a data matrix like this, uh, where some of the samples are cases, some of the samples are controls, and kind of um, ask which genes are differentially expressed between the two samples. Um, but we can filter this gene list actually for the transcription factors, for their corresponding transcription factors to figure out, is this transcription factor even expressed? So say you have a site of interest where you know a, a transcription factor can bind. Is it binding? How do you know? And so we use gene expression data to basically assume that if the gene for this transcription factor is expressed and we see that it has available binding sites, then it's probably it's probably binding there and regulating uh, that gene expression. So throughout my graduate school experience, I've practically used this integrative approach of um, looking at where transcription, transcription factor can bind and gene expression data to answer some of these questions. I can answer, you know, which genes are changing expression uh, between two conditions, between that case and control? Uh, which transcription factors have um, binding sites enriched around those genes? Because if if it does, then maybe that transcription factor is either turning it, turning that gene on or off. And lastly, um, just because it has a motif. Or, or that sequence there, it doesn't mean that it's actually binding. So I can then bring in that gene expression data again to ask, okay, of the sites that we see, um, the transcription factor binding sites that we see that are enriched around these genes, which of them are actually likely to cause the gene expression to change? So basically looking at of those transcription factors which are expressed. So I'm gonna to talk to you about how I apply this method and looking at addiction in the nucleus accumbens. So working together with my former lab mate, Dr. David Gallegos, we carried out a study on amphetamine addiction and its effects in the nucleus accumbens. And so this is a diagram of the mouse brain's reward circuitry. Um, and it's quite complex and includes and, and involves different areas like the hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex, uh, and the amygdala. But a lot of the signals tend to converge on the nucleus accumbens. If we zoom in and look at the nucleus accumbens here, it's made out of a lot of different cell types. Uh, but its major output cell, the, the major cell that kind of sends signals out of this region are D1 and D2 spiny projection neurons. And these make up um, over like 80, I would say over 70% of the cells in this area. Whereas there's a smaller cell population called um, inner neurons, which are kind of surrounding it here, that actually regulate the SPNs. They kind of control the major output cell. And so I'm in this study, we're focusing on these PV positive inner neurons. Um, they're PV positive because they express this PV gene um, quite highly. 
Um, but we're uh, focusing on these because a previous study from um, my graduate school lab showed that when we silence the output from those cells, mice actually fail to form um, drug addictive like behaviors. So this tiny, tiny cell is has a really um, impactful or, or a really high behavioral impact. And we think that there's some genomic changes uh, or, yeah, some genomic underpinnings of why this happens. And so to target these cells, um, Dr. David Gallegos used a uh, experimental technique to pull down these SPNs and, and purify these SPNs and these PV positive inner neurons. And we then, he then sequenced them. And I took the data through a pipeline to kind of ask the questions of, which genes are different between this tiny uh, inner neuron versus the major output cell, and also trying to find those transcription factors that may be regulating that drug response. Um, in this project, we use chromatin accessibility as a search space for uh, um, transcription factor binding. So as I kind of alluded to before, the more closed and compact the chromatin is, the it, it's associated with gene repression, whereas more permissive and open chromatin is associated with active gene expression. And so, as you can see, the more open um, the 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 DNA or the chromatin is, it allows easier for transcription factors to bind and things like RNA polymerase to bind and and transcribe a gene and activate that gene. Um, so here I'm using these, uh, we're using experimental methods to pull down where in the genome is open in these mice and in these specific cells, and then use that as search spaces for transcription factor binding. So again, this integrative approach, um, I'm gonna walk through kind of the, the steps that I took here. So the first step, we found the genes that were activated or repressed when mice were given amphetamine. So that's that case control, mice with amphetamine, mice without amphetamine, which genes are different. And then I looked at those genes and looked at the regulatory regions around those genes. So that's like the promoter region where RNA polymerase likes to bind to turn the genes on. And even like really far out distal enhancer regions where transcription factors are known to bind to regulate those genes. So I took the um, regulatory regions around the genes that change, actually express genes, and intersected that with the regions that had open chromatin. So I had these three sets of data, um, uh, regulatory regions uh, within a gene that have open chromatin, regulatory regions in the promoter regions, and then also in these very far off distal enhancer regions. And I used them as search spaces to find those transcription factor binding sites that were enriched. And I brought back in the gene expression data to basically filter the enriched list of transcription factors for those that were also expressed. So that resulted in transcription factors and in these regulatory regions of amphetamine-induced genes. And here are the results. On the y-axis here, I have the transcription factor binding sites that are predicted in the PV positive inner neurons and that major output cell, the SPNs. And on the x-axis, I have their transcriptional enrichment. So how, how much these genes were expressed in these cells. And I don't want you to worry about the actual transcription factors and the actual results. What I want you to focus on, the list of transcription factors between the PV inner neurons and the SPNs, the major output cells, are wildly different. So we have the same treatment amphetamine um, uh, showing that it's actually inducing a different epigenomic response in these two cell populations. Um, so that was really cool because, you know, you, you don't really think about, well, at least I didn't really think about how one, uh, one stimulant can activate different responses in our different cells. And even within a specific brain tissue who has kind of like one major role in addiction, um, the, the smaller subtypes of the cells in that region have different responses. And uh, now we can use this information to um, 
kind of understand better on a neurobiological scale what's happening so we can put together that um, story of the uh, how transcription factors are regulating uh, re uh, a response to drugs. Um, so that was uh, one of my projects. I, like I said, I recently defended um, last year, and here's some photos of some folks at my lab and me presenting some of my other research and me with a sword that I got <laughs> on the day that I defended. Um, it was a really great experience in terms of learning those three domains of uh, of being a computational biologist. Um, I also mentioned mentioned before what brought me into this field was kind of thinking about the health disparities um, that Black and Brown people face and wanting to figure out which of those have bases in the epigenome. So alongside my, my quest, my science quest to kind of understand these issues, I've also been heavily involved in the Black Women in Computational Biology Network. Um, and it's a network of over 200 members across the globe. And we are comprised of mainly of graduate students, but we're pulling in more working professionals and more undergrads as we grow. And oops. Um, and uh, our goals and our missions include amplifying voices uh, amongst Black women in the computational biology field. Um, and this kind of comes in the form of reposting things on social media, reposting people's wins within our within our um, membership. Um, but also on our website, we have a job board and a talent portal where recruiters can go and either post a job or look through our members and their amazing qualifications to try and recruit um, a more diverse workforce. Uh, we also work to develop cultural, culturally appropriate approaches <laughs> to train our members. And um, this can come in the form of technical training like uh, learning different bioinformatics skills, but a lot of it comes in a form of teaching our members the kind of the hidden curriculums in science. And so learning, you know, what it takes to publish a paper, what the review process is like, how to choose a lab in grad school, or how to get certain experiences to make themselves more um, competitive in the workforce. And lately we've been, um, well, not lately, this has always been our thing. We like to increase the visibility of Black computational biologists in um, various forms of communications. Uh, we have a seminar series, Black and Comp Bio, on our YouTube channel. And we also are starting to focus on uh, just listening to the career journeys of other Black computational biologists, uh, which you can find on in the podcast series. So definitely go check the website out, check us out on Twitter. And uh, yeah, we'd love to collaborate with uh, folks. So either, you know, have seminars or put on different workshops. Um, but now I'm at RTI International where I'm still working with genomic data, but more with human genomic data. So it's a little bit cooler to me. Um, and RTI is a nonprofit research organization uh, that aims to improve the human health condition. And there's a wide, wide range of research and work that happens in RTI. But what I've seen from my genomics corner of RTI is that we do a lot of government agency funded research. So um, uh, a lot of NIH and DOD, Def Department of Defense uh, funded research and tackling some of those, uh, yeah, big research questions that the government wants answered. We do a lot of coordinating center work. Um, so coordinating uh, certain clinical trials, data coordinating, and also coordinating research across multi, uh, multiple institutions. Sometimes this means kind of the like the project the planning part of things, but a lot of times this also means um, performing different integrative analyses across different institutions um, using uh, the data that they've collected. And then this uh, last point is more like what you think of when you think of a contract research organization, but we also perform analyses from, uh, yeah, private research organizations and, uh, yeah, analyze different kinds of data, and in my case, different kinds of genomic data. I 
have learned a lot in my short time here at RTI, like things like uh, cloud computing and different modeling techniques. I've been able to be a part of a wide array of projects, including looking at how DNA methylation changes in response to alcohol abuse disorder, or even looking at how certain genomic variants are associated with a specific disease. So up on the screen, I'm uh, showing you some of the publications from members at RTI to highlight some of the work that we do that I'm particularly interested in. And um, a lot of these projects integrate across multiple data sources, including exposure, um, environmental data, uh, to really better understand the human health condition. Uh, we have uh, some projects here that looks at uh, schizophrenia families and look at the genetic risk variance to, that increases bipolar disorder, increases your risk for bipolar disorder or major depressive disorder. Um, this cool study that looked at early life um, exposure to uh, to a farm or being, you know, growing up on a farm and how that actually reduces your risk for eczema as an adult. Um, this study that uh, integrates like environmental health record data and uh, environmental health, sorry, uh, what is the word? Electronic health uh, data. So data collected from hospitals and clinics, environmental data and genetic risk factors to kind of find out of these, what are those risk factors for substance use disorder? Um, and I, as a big part and a big effort of RCI in having a more, not only having a more diverse workforce, but also having more diverse uh, samples in their studies, uh, this study uh, creates new methods to kind of combine different ancestries, um, genomic data to find uh, risks for tobacco use and even uh, selects or predicts uh, great gene targets for drug repurposing for treatment for tobacco addiction. Um, and then this last one is uh, a study that looked at alcohol consumption before college and, uh, and, and trauma exposure before college and compared the before and uh, during college experience to, to show different risk factors to increased alcohol consumption. Um, these are just, you know, five of the first ones that I saw that that I really liked and wanted to highlight. But there's lots more here at RTI that we're doing. Um, so as you can see here, there's some really cool research happening at RTI and um, lots of opportunity for for me to explore the, the ties between genomics, um, equitable living spaces and, and equity overall and the environment. And with that, I would just like to say thank you for um, inviting me to be on this series. I'm so honored and thank you all for listening. And we'll, yeah, take some questions. Excellent stuff. Thank you, Melissa. Glad that we could have you on the program. Uh, I'll invite everybody who's watching, wherever you are, uh, just start clapping. Maybe maybe there'll be somebody down the hall. You'll hear them clapping. You go, oh, yeah, they were watching. Uh, yeah, amazing stuff. I mean, the research you've done, very impressive. Uh, and you, you're just like home runs, knocking everything out of the park. That's, that's incredible. Thank you. Um, so viewers, I'm going to encourage you, drop your thoughts and questions into the chat. I'm going to be looking to your thoughts experiences and questions in just a moment, uh, but I'll give everybody a minute to sort of download and then get things into the chat. I'm kind of curious, Melissa, uh, how you got interested in and then involved in the computational biology network. Where yeah. Did you help create it or did you hear about it and then say, I want to be a part of it? How did that get started? Yeah, so um, I, I heard about it and wanted to be a part of it, but I met the founder while she was doing um, her round of graduate school interviews. Um, unfortunately, she didn't decide to go to Duke and be besties with me. That's fine. But <laughs> we've actually grown, um, grown together a lot over these last couple of years. And she founded um, the network um, in early 2020. And I kind of just got involved, um, uh, I guess, kind of early and helped. Uh, with planning seminars and inviting speakers and 
uh, a lot of the behind the scenes logistics work. That's kind of where I like to stay. And uh, she's been super amazing in growing the network and, you know, expanding it uh, globally and uh, yeah, just finding and connecting different uh, resources and opportunities for, for the network. That's excellent stuff. Have you done uh, Have you done talks and presentations, or led a seminar for for the network? Like you did I have with not. Us? No, I have not. Um, I well, we did have a uh, uh, kind of like a symposium last year where people highlighted their works and did kind of these lightning talks, and I participated in that. But I, yeah, I tend to stay on like the behind the scenes <laughs> type of uh, roles there and uh, ironing out some of the logistics. Since you uh, I, were sort of in at the ground floor, what's been the response to the network, like bringing in members and getting people's feedback and, and what they're looking for? How has it been? Yeah, it's been it's been really rewarding. One, just to kind of have a, a central place to kind of network and communicate with folks that look like me and sometimes have similar research interests as me. Um, you kind of have a space where you feel a little bit more comfortable to kind of ask maybe some of those like what you think of as a, a, a stupid question. But everyone there has been um, it's, it's just been really been like a helpful environment. Like a lot of times when I have questions about like a computational approach, I kind of just pop it in our Slack group and, you know, someone with you know their expertise are able to help guide me. And I think that's one of the biggest things that we provide for our members is just having a community um, where we can share resources. That's fantastic. And uh, a, a very important thing to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, uh, at least like I'm sitting here thinking like computational biology seems hard. And uh, like, obviously, you're brilliant. And so you're Thank brilliant you. at it. And my brain is like, uh, nope, statistics and comp bio is not going to be my strong suit for sure. Uh, but then finding finding other people to to network with and to hash out problems and uh or i don't know vent maybe even when you're yeah. code and when you've got thousands of lines of code and it just doesn't work <laughs> yeah it's 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 been very helpful in in that sense and uh yeah we're looking for opportunities to grow and um continually meet our members needs so it's it's also been interesting seeing the shift of what our members are looking for as well. Oh, how so? Um, I think at first we served pretty much like kind of like an online community of like, you know, sharing resources. But um, I think as as we've grown, we've we've gotten a lot of um I won't say request, but interest in actually collaborating in different projects together. Um, we recently published a paper on how to kind of build communities like this. And so I think there's interest in the group to do more work where we can collaborate and share our, yeah, share our findings um, as a way to kind of like get get more experience in the in the science realm. Oh, that's fantastic. That's awesome. Okay, uh, let me turn to the chat for their questions. And let's see what's uh, popped up here now. Okay, Will wants to know, how do you explain the field of computational biology to someone who has never heard of it? I, I usually say comp bio is basically uh, taking math and taking uh, data and making sense of it. Um, it's It's a really broad field, like I mentioned earlier, where you can take a wide array of biological data. Um, but I think once you're using math models to kind of interpret lots of data, you kind of meet that computational biology requirement. Hope that helped, Will. Oh, here, here's a name you might recognize. Uh, Dr. Bronwyn Williams wants to know, 
how quickly can epigenetic changes occur and what is the longevity of those changes? You mentioned yeah. that some epigenetic changes can be passed down a generation. Can they persist across multiple generations? Yeah, so the, these are actually very controversial questions. <laughs> okay. um, so some, uh, some epigenetic changes have been thought to kind of have a long-lasting effect. Like DNA methylation has historically been thought to have a longer-lasting effect. Like once those uh, nucleotides become methylated, they're kind of there for a long time. Whereas histone tail modifications, because our DNA like unwinds and then comes back together when our cells are dividing, um, those tend to turn over as well. Um, so there's lots of uh, research around these areas of how long does a DNA methylation or uh, an epigenomic modification last and what those implications are. And um, in terms of passing down these, um, yeah, these epigenetic marks uh, generationally, that's also uh, things that need more study. There, there have been certain, I feel like a few keystone studies that have shown like this epigenomic uh, uh, modification has effects in later generations, but it isn't as clear cut as that as most research questions are. So it's something that I'm definitely interested in finding out more about. Okay, interesting stuff. Uh, similarly, Michael ha asked early in the talk, do you think that the environment can have an effect on a person's development besides their genetics? Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe that is epigenetics. Yeah, yeah. So, Fair. yes, my ministry is genetics and, and, and genomics, so I can't speak with great detail about other um, things, but definitely I feel like the environment, um, uh, depending on what what kind of things you're exposed to and um, your lifestyle habits absolutely has an effect on um, your your overall health, especially if it's something that's accumulating over time. Like I like to think of things as like having a balance. You know, I can't go to the store and buy all organic food and vet all my products. But like if I have a good balance, I feel like I hopefully I'll be okay. <laughs> is is computational biology or bioinformatics uh a tool or a method that would allow you to investigate the different types of potential epigenetic changes like you mentioned earlier like stressors in the environment uh your proximity to to toxins or pollutants uh yeah where you live and what the environment there is like if it's if it's treed or not uh, right you, yeah. you know like redlined areas or yeah. so that's you know. yeah in in an ideal world where we can collect data um from a pretty diverse uh group of people and collect that information about like where they live and what are those pollution uh, points that are near th near them? How long have they lived there? You know, what's their diet? Um, are they eating mostly like, I, I don't know, quote unquote, healthy foods or more junk foods? And in an ideal world, we can collect all of that information um, reliably uh, and not because <laughs> people like to answer surveys, you know, kind of all over the place sometimes. So yeah, in an ideal world, we can collect all that information. There's definitely um, areas in where we can develop methods and, and computational approaches to kind of answer those questions. But I think one of the biggest challenges getting that information um, from, from diverse groups and also uh, trusting that information is reliable. Like we can't, as scientists go and kind of like, write down their you know daily moves that would kind of be intrusive right <laughs> sure, yeah uh and i thought it was uh it was uh what's the right word it was meaningful that you sort of you learn about genomics and then you learn about epigenomics and how you know a person's life history can influence something that seems so unchangeable as as our genes and dna Right. But to, when you really dive in, uh, all of those things in a person's life history end up really mattering, and they matter not just to the individual, but to to their offspring and possibly maybe generations beyond. And finding a lot of like meaning in that, 
And then specifically, like you mentioned, that these things impact people of color, black and brown communities disproportionately. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's kind of my, I guess what I would like to further my career in is kind of investigating those questions. Um, uh, because we do, you know, like you kind of hear like if you grow up in a like unstable environment, you're more likely to have different mental health issues. And, you know, I'm just thinking about what are the genetic and epigenetic components of that? Like what are the actual biological um, mechanisms behind that? And once we can uncover those, um, uh, we can we can start to think about different therapies that can you know, maybe there's an epigenetic modification that that changes if you grow up in a traumatic environment. Maybe we can find and and develop uh, therapies that can target that and remove it or add something back to kind of help with um, the the health outcomes or the the implications of of those of that. Absolutely, uh, Murray Burgess wanted to know, have you encountered any gender slash racial bias in your work or in your field? If so, how do you address that? Yeah. So for most of my uh, grad school, uh, I've, I've worked only in mice populations. Um, and a lot of times uh, people or a scientist, we have to take into consideration the gender when we're looking at the ge genomic data. Sometimes you'll see all, you know, Male, male mice studies or all female mice studied or um, computational methods that kind of correct for those gender differences. Uh, and within the human health um, field, I've only been here for a couple months, but I, I do know that uh, historically, most a lot of genetic studies are done on European ancestries. So it's um, it's a really big deal and a really important thing to kind of make sure that your samples are diverse and to develop methods to uh, disentangle what are the genetic differences between coming from different ancestral backgrounds versus a genetic uh, difference that's leading or causing or associated with a disease. And so there's lots of um, research and work done to create computational methods to deal with that issue. Okay, yeah, that's that's fascinating. Especially since there's, like you were talking about, there's more and more research coming out that shows that uh, people of color, black and brown people are disproportionately affected by so many of the things that you mentioned. And then the research that's happening, the data that's being collected, and the questions that are being asked are being asked of people who might not be experiencing so many of, uh, of those impacts. Right. And that's a huge, that's a big gap. Yes. And some, um, there, there are so many layers to this issue because sometimes it's, it's, um, right. uh, a problem with not having the sample size to kind of do the analysis for different ancestries or, um, right. Conflating the differences between or the genomic variation that we see between, the ancestral variation versus what's actually attributed to uh, the association with a specific disease. Um, some some communities have, uh, you know, agreements with the government that they should not take their genomic data. They should not analyze their genomic data. And so there's lots of ethical concerns as well as nuances when trying to tackle this problem. Excellent, excellent point. Thank you. All right. Uh, it looks like that'll be it for today. Melissa, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Glad that you could be here. Thanks for sharing. Uh, and thanks to all of our viewers, too, for tuning in to this edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Glad that you could be with us. We will be back here again next Wednesday at noon with another great presentation. Next week, we're going to be meeting the Associate Director for the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission, who's giving a talk called Civil Rights Placemaking in North Carolina. You can find information about that presentation at naturalsciences.org, or you can head to the Office of Environmental Education's website, eenorthcarolina.org. You can see the schedule of events at both places uh, at the Environmental Education website, 
You can also sign up for the Lunchtime Discoveries email newsletter. That way you get the YouTube link in your inbox every single week. It'll be right there ready for you to click and come join us right here at the museum's YouTube channel every single time. Uh, so I hope that I'll see everybody here next Wednesday at noon for another edition of the show. Thanks for all of your questions and comments in the chats, folks, and have a happy Wednesday. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody.